Hello and welcome once again to the Knights Temper Church. My name is Reverend Steve Criscoll and this is our sermon for today. It's entitled A Man for Our Times and it's taken from 2 Timothy 2 uh, starting at verse 1 through to 17. So before we uh, begin the sermon I'd just like to um, have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father we pray Lord that you will uh, enlighten us and embolden us in our as we read your word and understand those things that have been passed on to us by our trusted brethren so long ago. We thank you, Father God, for the blessings of their uh, work and their experience. We pray, Lord, that we can emulate them and be better, better Christians. Lord, we ask these things in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, let's begin then, uh, if you'd like to open up your Bible, King James Bible, at 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, and we will read the first uh, 17 verses, which reads, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strives for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboureth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the gospel, to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. So says God's word. Okay, so today uh, I'm not going to pull any punches. I've got something that I want to say to everyone watching this sermon. And here's the short version of what I want to say. Now we'll expand on this, but the short version is this. We all need to pull up our socks, or pull our socks up. Now if you're not familiar with that phrase, I'll just expand it a little bit. We're, it means we're not getting on with the work that we were explicitly told to do. Now, what I'd like you to do, just for a minute, look around the world. Don't go, you don't need to go searching. You can just open your mind and look and see what's going on in the world in 2023, which is when I'm right recording this. What do you see? Well, I, I can't know what you see, but I'll tell you what I see. I see a world that is in abject, dire peril. I see a world that's ready to self-destruct. And I'm not talking about climate change or, you know, or any other pandemic that might pop up in the next few months or years. With everything that's going on, and there's far too much that we can even begin to touch here today, the question I have to ask is, what are we Christians doing about it? Are we living righteous lives to begin with? Are we full steam ahead for Jesus? Or are we sitting at home slumped in front of the TV, 
mindlessly watching games of football or reruns of whatever? Do we see Christians faithfully reading their Bibles? Do we see them spreading the good news of the resurrection of Christ, as was mentioned in our passage, or are they silent on the subject? You see, I have a lot of questions about many of the Christians that I see. But this isn't, it's not a new thing, yeah? Uh, it's a phenomenon that's been around ever since I was first uh, uh, gave my life to the Lord, and that's back in 1985. I'm sure it was going on before then. See, what I do is I question their motivation. I question their intent, these and when it comes down to it, sometimes I, I have to actually question their salvation. I mean, so I've got another question I need to ask. How on earth is it possible for a person who is saved to sit quietly and never speak about Jesus to anyone? Here's another question on a similar line. How spiritually deaf must a person be not to be able to hear or feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit that lives within them? You know, you could come up with, oh, a boatload of excuses. I just can't find the words to say, or, or it's not the sort of person that I'm cut out to be. And another, here's another one, a favourite. Well, that's the pastor's job, isn't it? You know, the list of excuses could go on forever, really. But I'll tell you, I think there's a couple of problems here. Well, there's a problem, but I think there's a couple of reasons for it. Here's the first reason that I think is the main problem. And the main, this main problem, I think, is that people are simply scared. Second reason. I think people have a distinct lack of self-discipline. And that speaks to their character. There's another one that I've, you know, recently thought about as well. And it's not a pleasant thought, especially when we're talking about Christians. But I think that many people are just plain lazy. You might disagree. But actually, you know, I think most often people just don't know what it truly means to be a Christian. And they don't know these things because they don't study, they don't read the Bible. And the responsibility comes on other Christians because they don't teach other people. Certainly, in my experience, about what it means to be a Christian. It's just a matter of lip service to a lot of people. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, so what? It's okay. I'll just think, carry on thinking and believing what I believe about X, Y, and Z. It doesn't be, well, what it says in the Bible is this and that. And excuse, excuse, excuse. And they reason their way into believing what they want to believe. Falsely, I hasten to add. So what's the big problem? Well, let's go back to our scripture. You've heard what I think and you've heard my concerns. Let's see what our Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago had to say about, well, these issues. <clears throat> and he kicks off with this. He starts off in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's an instruction, isn't it? <clears throat> be strong. Don't skip over the words. that They mean something. They really, really do. Therefore, my son, we'll come to that in a minute, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. What does that mean? He's telling Timothy and also us, don't forget, because we're reading it, that we need to be strong not only in grace, which in a sense, essence means goodness. But we need to be strong. We need to have spiritual strength, which is given to all believers, believers. Timothy taught, uh, sorry, Paul taught Timothy at length. It's not just in this letter. They spent many years together. Paul teaching Timothy. And we can see 
that he, as, we, as it says in that first verse, he even regarded Timothy as close to him as if he were his own son. So when he says in the next verse, verse 2, he says, And the things, Timothy, that's in brackets, I added that, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Which is what I said earlier, isn't it? He's saying, Timothy, I've taught you very well, son. Now, pass on what you have been taught to other men that you can see are strong in the faith and in the spirit. This is not... Is this Paul speaking, or is it Jesus? Well, if you think about it, the Great Commission that Jesus gave us, all of us, is to do exactly that. And all Paul is doing is telling Timothy to do the same. How can you do that if you don't have a strong connection to God? Through the Holy Spirit, through the Scriptures. How on earth are we ever going to do God's will? What's the big problem? Well, that's the problem. How are we ever going to do God's will if we don't know him? How can we hear him? How can we know him? How can we possibly influence other people to come to know God if we don't know him ourselves? If I give you a little illustration. I've worked in schools and I've done quite a bit of teaching in different avenues. So I'm going to use a teacher as, a, as an example. Imagine an English teacher. All right, an English teacher is brought up in, let's say he's brought up in Britain, he's been to a good university, he's majored, his major uh, is in English language and literature, he's come out of college, he's done his teacher training course, he's gone into work in, in high schools with teenagers, and he teaches English every day of his academic life. Then, one day, he's asked by the head teacher or the head of year, look, we've got the, the, the guys who are, uh, in the, there's a physics teacher gone off. Can you just fill in? What am I teaching? It's physics. I don't know anything about physics, except what I learned at school. Um, well, what we do, what they were doing is they're teaching, they're learning about electronic transistors and how they work. How is he supposed to do that? Has he ever trained in like, Does he know anything about the valence zone in a PNP or an MPN transistor? Does he know which way current flows in order to gain amplification? Does he know how to bias a transistor in order to get the, the amplification you need? Do you need to know where the resistance is in a transistor circuit to be able to... Blah, 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 blah. Now, I only know about that stuff because I used to be an electronics technician myself. I've done the training. I'm not an expert, but I've done the training. What about your English teacher? What's he going to do? He's going to scratch his head and he's going to go, I know what, um, we'll do something about Shakespeare, shall we, instead? Because he hasn't got a clue. You can't pass on what you don't know. You can't educate people with stuff that you've never studied. And if you're trying to do that, you're a fool. It's impossible. So here's what we're looking for. What are we looking for in, in a Christian? We're looking for men and women, of course, who are not afraid to study. They're not afraid to suffer. They're not afraid to love others. And they're not afraid to trust other people. But that, those, are, those are sort of very wide uh, sort of areas, aren't they? If you want to, well, let's add some more to that, more specifically. What we're looking for is we need people who can overcome the fear of proclaiming Christ to others. Yes, overcome. I didn't say eradicate it, because nobody can just say, turn it off. It's, there isn't a switch that says fear off. Yeah? Overcome fear. People who are able to exercise self-discipline in their life. Hmm? People who have the dis self-discipline again to be able to walk in the light and shun the dark. People who can devote themselves to doing good, righteous work. People who, who can use and develop 
the gifts that they have, the gifts that, that God has given them, either skill gifts that they've learned in their life or Holy Spirit gifts, to serve other people. See, there's a lot of things there, right? you know. But, but these are the things that we need to develop in anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Now, nobody's going to develop all of that stuff in massive measure. We're all different. We all have different personalities, uh, different strengths and weaknesses and so on. But these should be our goals, should they not? And if I'm honest, I don't see a lot of it about. And, in truth, it disturbs me greatly. So let's look further. I want to look further oh, to help everyone to try and understand some of what it means to follow Christ. And we're doing that by looking at our scripture today. There's many things that we could say about this, but let's focus on what Paul had to say to Timothy in this letter. Hopefully this will help us. To begin with, Paul gives him three illustrations. Now, we may have skipped over them uh, in reading this, but they mean they're, they're, they're important, so that's why we're looking at them. The first one, the first illustration that Paul uses is that of a soldier. Verse 3, he says this. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, there are two separate points in those two verses. First one, life as a soldier is hard. I've done a bit of soldiery myself. Yeah, I was in the Air Force, but I did join the Army. I have run around in, in a camouflage suit with backs, packs on my back and carrying rifles and all that. It wasn't fun and it was very hard sometimes. But again, being a true soldier is... A hard life. Imagine a Roman soldier, can you, for a moment. Go back 2,000 years. You can go back as far as you like until the beginning of the Roman Empire. It never changed. The Roman soldier had a life that was so hard. It's very hard for us to imagine. Had to march across countries. No jeeps, no transport trucks, no horses for the Roman soldier. And he had to walk. Everywhere he went, and everywhere he went, he was carrying that big battle shield, yeah, apart from his armour, of course, on that uh, relatively short sword that they used, the battle shield, and an eight-foot uh, thing with a point on the end. Lance, we call it, or spear, if you like. Their main battle weapons, they had to carry with them everywhere. Can you imagine walking hundreds of miles, carrying that lot? That alone is going to harden you up, toughen you up. You either collapse and die, or you graft on, don't you, in those circumstances. And let's not forget the kit they had to carry to survive. You see, that's, that's one of the pictures that Paul's showing us. He, in, in just a couple of words, he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. He's... he's eliciting that idea of the knowledge of what it would be like to be a soldier in his day. Now, I could use modern examples. Uh, I don't remember which commando it was that was commando group that was walking across the frozen hills of the Falklands to retake the islands. Or we could talk about the men in modern, more modern battles. Well, that was modern, obviously. That was in 1982. Go back a bit to the 1940s and those poor guys who had to not only land on beaches and be killed by the thousands, but had to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and then walk into France, and then walk across France, fighting Belgium, and then fight, and continue all the way until they ended up in Berlin. Imagine how hard that was. And I've spoken to a couple of guys who have made that trip, and it's not pleasant, I can promise you. Just imagine then the level of self-discipline that you need to be able to push yourself through such a difficult life. Yet the Romans did it as a career. And countless other soldiers have endured a similar experienced kind of life throughout history. Now, the second point in this, in verse 4, if you can imagine then, you know, with a life like that, 
the soldier needs to focus on just one thing, doesn't he? Is what well, maybe he might think about his girlfriend back home or his wife and children. Uh, he might think it from time to time. But day by day, every day, what has he got to focus on? Soldiering. Because if he doesn't, then he's going to have a problem. He doesn't have time or energy to ponder or be involved in the things of the world. Am I doing the right thing? Should I be marching with this particular general and going to war in Italy or what? Well, not Italy, I'm sorry, in France or whatever it is? His only concern is to be the best soldier he can be. If he wants to progress to promotion and responsibilities. Now, to be a true soldier of Christ, a Christian, we've got to build endurance. Now, I'm not saying you should go yomping over uh, the Brecon Beacons every day, you know, or climbing the Rocky Mountains. It's, that's, no, that's not what I'm saying. Endurance is being able to endure this world without falling into the traps of this world. Enjoy, en, sorry, endure the slings and arrows that are thrown at us in this life, simply for being Christian both verbally and even sometimes, often in fact, physical violence. This is not an option, not if we want to please him who commissioned us into this life. Now, that's the first illustration. The second one I want to give you, or rather is the one that uh, was given to us by Paul, is the athlete. You're going to scratch your head and think, where does it say athlete in there? Okay. Well, when you see, well, I'll just read that verse again. It's in verse 5. It says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is not, he is not crowned, yet is he not crowned? Is he not crowned? It's a question. Except he strive lawfully. Striving for masteries. A stri someone who strives for masteries is the translation of the word, what? Athleo, from the Greek. Athleo, which means athlete. And an athlete is someone who contends in competitive games. And that's the explanation that you get from Strong's. So I didn't make that up. Okay? So, we're talking about an athlete. He's talking about an athlete. And what is he saying about them? If you want to strive for mastery... In other words, if you want to be a, an athlete who wins their particular uh, discipline in, athlete, in athletics, then to do so, you're going to have to follow the rules of the game. Because it is a game. Any athletics is a game, isn't it? It's someone competing against someone else. The athlete, to be an athlete, you've got to train and train and train and practice and train and follow the rules. We don't mention that very often uh, when we're talking about it, but athletics has rules. For example, just to give you modern athletics today, if you're going to run the 100 metres, yeah, you're sitting in your blocks on the floor you're, with your feet in the blocks. You've got your hands on the ground. You're waiting for the, 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 the starter gun. And if you set off before the starter gun, even a split second, it's a false start, isn't it? If you f do that three times in the same race, obviously, you'll be disqualified. Is that not a rule? The rules of the game say you can't cheat. We don't let you cheat. Everybody has a, 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 an equal opportunity. It's just down to your ability, if you're going to win or not. They must be strong to compete. Compete. They've got to follow the rules. So Paul is inferring that firstly, we, we've got to be well trained. And we need to have uh, the ability to contend with other people. That means to, to deal with, to work with other people, to talk with other people, to have ways and strategies of being able to speak the gospel to other people. It's a kind of competition, I suppose, if you think about that. And if you want to win the prize, and what's the prize for us? The prize is that a person turns their life to Jesus. That's not a prize for me. It's a prize for God. So, what does this mean for Christians? Well, it means that Christians need to have a sound knowledge of God through his scriptures and living a life which is righteous according to his rules. 
You can't do it any way you please. Oh, yeah, I'll go to church next month. I can't, I can't be bothered. I have to get up on a Sunday and the kids and blah, 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 and driving now, it's a pain. I can't be bothered. Is that you? Sometimes, yes, when I, you know, when I was young and I had small children, sometimes I thought, this is hard, doing this on a Sunday. It was, but I did it every Sunday. If you step outside the rules or live your life outside of those rules, oh, what rules are we talking about? Oh, yeah, the ones that I have on the wall on my, in my uh, room here, that's mainly for the benefit of my granddaughter so that she will learn the Ten Commandments. We're following those rules, not the rules of Satan, which, by the way, are the ways of the world, because this world belongs to him at the moment. So that's your second one. Third one, the farmer. Yes, there's a farmer in there. Uh, he calls him, we'll read verse 6 again, the husbandman that laboureth must be first partaker of the fruits. Okay, the husbandman is a farmer. Yeah, that's what it is. And he labours. He works hard. He has to. If he doesn't, he won't partake of any of the fruits. That's basically what it's saying. It might seem a bit strange when you first see this and you think, what's a husbandman and what's he talking about laboureth and why should he be the first one to eat fruit? Okay. <laughs> the emphasis here is on hard work. And the picture is the life of a farmer, which again is hard. But we need to forget our modern view of farming to some degree and think of what it was like, the sheer back-breaking work of what it was like 2,000 years ago, and has been ever since, really, until they invented machines to help you out. Ploughing the fields meant what? Well, no, you didn't get your tractor out because there was no such thing. You got your oxen out, usually one, I think. Or if you were extremely well off, you could have a, a big horse, but it was always usually an oxen. Now, these are massive creatures, and you tie them up, and you stick a plough on the back of it, and you have to guide this oxen up and down this field with your little blade that sticks in the ground, and you're holding it into the ground. So that's, can you imagine how hard that is in the blazing sun, all day, ploughing a field, trying to guide an oxen that's stronger than about 20 men? Not an easy thing to do. That's just one job of the ancient farmer. Then there's the planting of the seeds. Then there's the uh, tending of the, 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 the crops as they grow gradually. Vermin that you've got to get rid of and stop them eating. Setting fires so smoke goes over the uh, thing to, to try and protect it against insects and so on and so on. And all these things that you have to do. And then you've got to harvest it. And what are you harvesting it with? Harvest, uh, uh, what is it? A combine harvester? No. By hand. Oh yeah, combine harvest is great. <laughs> Drive along and it gathers up all the wheat from your from your field and then spits out the waste in a in a nice bundled up uh what do you call it behind you? I'm not a farmer. Shoot me if I've got that wrong. Okay. Now about the farmer eating the fruits first. If he doesn't do the work, his family starves to death. So he has to be the first one that he takes the fruit from the, the basically to Make uh, have the take the benefit from the things that he's been growing. If he's growing wheat in the field, he wants to be able to make uh, flour with it, doesn't he? Flour makes your bread or barley if you're poor. Now, three illustrations, and you can probably see there's one sort of inescapable connecting fact between all three of them, and here it is: if you don't put in the effort. There can be no reward, no gain, no fruit. Call it what you like. <clears throat> and Paul, he doesn't just stop there. He then follows immediately after speaking about these things. He says, he says this, verse 7. Consider what I say. So in other words, are you listening? Have you listened to what I've been saying? He's not saying it quite like that to Timothy, but basically in a nice way, he's saying, consider what I say. Think about it. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. So Paul seems to think that the, the, the information that he's just given us in this illustration should give us the answer to all things. All things to do with the topic we're talking about. Now it's not, a just, it's not just a throwaway comment. It's, it's 
what he's saying is that if you don't learn all these ways and learn to be harder, to endure, and so on, you're going to fail in your work with God, for God, and in your walk with God. Sounds negative. Well, it is. So let's flip it and put a positive spin on it, shall we? So he's actually saying, if you can learn to endure as a soldier endures, to train hard like an athlete does, which means studying God's word, if you can put in the long hours of preparation and daily work, then you will reap the rewards of those labors. You'll be strong in spirit, effective in sharing the good news. You'll be able to withstand those slings and arrows I mentioned, and fists and sticks and beatings and shootings. And I'm not exaggerating. From the unbelievers, by the way. If you can be determined to continue what we call an indomitable spirit, if you can be confident and self-disciplined, then you can be a true soldier for Christ. But there's more. There always is, isn't there? Paul wants to remind us of why it is that we should train in, you know, ourselves in these kind of ways. He said in verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Well, this is a fundamental truth, isn't it? Paul passed on in his training of Timothy many, many things. But he here reminds us of that one thing, that one truth that provides us with the absolute proof that Jesus is in fact who he says he is, the Son of God. It should be something that is etched on our hearts and in our minds. Jesus rose from the dead. But that's, that's not all that Paul has to say. You might think that's enough. But please remember, at the time of writing this, he was a prisoner in Rome. He's rem he reminds us of that in his, in his letter. He's not doing that to say, oh, poor me, what a shame. No, he's not asking you to, to have uh, sympathy for him. But it's another illustration he's using. He's using himself the hardship that he has had to endure to bring you the gospel. He says in verse 9 and 10, Wherein I suffer trouble, <laughs> trouble, that's an understatement, as an evildoer, even unto bonds, handcuffs. Yeah? But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that's you and me, that they may also obtain obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So, what's his trouble? Well, he's locked in a nasty prison in somewhere in the depths of, of Rome. He's in chains in a Roman prison. But he says, as if I am a criminal, basically. He's not a criminal. He's done nothing wrong except proclaim the word of God which kind of goes against the Romans' creed of, well, you need to, to be a Roman citizen. You ha or in Rome, you have to bow down to the numerous gods that we have and also bow and accept Caesar as a god as well. Uh, Paul wasn't going to do that. Well, he might be in chains, of course, but God's word isn't, is what he's saying. He suffers because he's been, well, outspoken, like I said. He's been speaking the truth of the gospel, and that's why he was arrested in, where was it? Uh, Caesarea, I think it was. And then, after a, a lot of argy-bargy argy with local officials, eventually got transported out, deported to Rome to be executed. And what did he do? He did that simply because he continued to do that which Christ had commissioned him to do. So if you think about it, Paul set us a standard, and he's reminding Timothy of the standard, of what it takes sometimes to be a Christian. I mean, it's a lofty standard, to be fair, but it's an example even so. 
I mean, it might be that, you know, if you speak out the Lord's truth, there's very harsh punishment. So be it. You might think, yeah, but if somebody's holding a gun to your head, so be it. Right, if you're any good at self-defense and you feel the urge, you could try and get the gun off the guy and try and stop him from shooting you if you want. But if you can't, if you're facing a firing squad, so be it. I think there's a nice little uh, element of that in what Paul is saying. It's a little sort of um, a faithful saying, he calls it. All right, well, let's see. It says, verse 11, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, good. You're with the Lord. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So, in a way, that's basically what we've been saying. He's giving the positives and the negatives in a fairly short, punchy form. But he also gives us a command to remember in the next verse, which I'll read, verse 14. He says, of these things, put them in remembrance. Get them filed away in here. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So, in other words, don't quarrel and fall out about specific words. Because all that does is cause division, and that's a dangerous thing. And I've been seeing some of that myself recently, where people insist that their view or their interpretation of Scripture is right and so on. Now, if that's just about a small thing that has no bearing on Christian doctrine, fine. It's okay. It's not necessarily healthy particularly, but if you start arguing the, the toss about, about doctrinal, doctrinal issues, things of fundamental importance to the Christian faith, uh-oh. Instead, Paul says in verse 15, Show, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the key, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not making it up yourself, not coming up with some strange doctrine that you just thought of and think you'll go with that and ignore what, what your pastor is teaching you and telling you, assuming your pastor is telling you the right thing. How do you know? Well, there's only one way of knowing. Get your head into a Bible, into a course, whatever it takes, and learn about God. Study the Scriptures. Learn the doctrines of Christ as they were given to you without adding or subtracting. Simple as that. Be a person that Jesus would approve of. And that means taking on board the things, some of the things, well, all of the things we've been talking about today. That way you're not going to be ashamed. When that day when you are in, kneeling in front of uh, Jesus and or his uh, angels on Judgment Day, you will not feel ashamed. You can say to yourself, I've done the best I can. There's a lot more we could say on this subject, I suppose. And Paul doesn't stop there in his, in his instruction to Timothy. But today we must, we must stop there. Now, I agree with Paul, as you can imagine, that there's an awful lot of work that we've all got to do. But firstly, the work starts here. These things that he's written, they're not just idle ramblings of a man who's going to be executed. These are heartfelt truths that, he, that he's been teaching for many years. And they are, if you like, there are, there are also a pleading not begging, but a pleading to his students and to others to remember what they were taught so they may be true Christians and what they help others to be is also to be true and righteous Christians. So all these things today we've got to take to heart. To be Yes, to be a Christian is not an easy thing. But we're commissioned to, to, sit, to sit in our armchairs. Oh, no, we're not. We're commissioned to go out there and exercise our duties and our responsibilities to the Lord. 
So if the soldier does not endure, then he's punished or even killed. If the athlete doesn't train, won't win his race. No reward. And if the farmer doesn't tend the land and his animals and his crops, then he and his family starves. And so do other people, probably. If the Christian does not learn to be like these people, well, then he's useless in God's kingdom. Be like Timothy, full of zeal for Christ, full of love and compassion for others, full of determination to fulfill his responsibilities before God. So what I would say to you, brothers and sisters, and those of you who may not know the Lord yet, be a Christian. Amen. That's the end of our sermon for today. I pray that it's been useful to you. Please come and join me again uh, the next time. And uh, until then, I would say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And uh, stay safe until next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.